So is there a tendency for software architecture and for code to be viewed as unrelated things? Sometimes. Uh, I, I guess the easiest way to explain this is if you, if you have uh, like an architecture diagram on the wall, people often draw boxes to represent things, and those things could be uh, components or services or layers. Uh, and, and when we're writing the code, we, we don't have those same constructs in the code. So we're writing classes and namespaces and packages and interfaces. Uh, and that's, that's kind of why these two worlds never quite meet. So the diagrams say one thing, the code says something else. And they diverge at some point in time. So the, the, the thing I'm really interested in is how we can join these two things back together again. Do you think it should be possible to, to actually identify a, a piece of software's architecture by actually reading the code? And if so, is that something that should be aspired to? I would love to see that happen, actually. Um, if, if you take any piece of code, it's actually really hard to, to figure out what the underlying architecture is sometimes. So if you, if you kind of step back and say, well, what's the big picture of the system? You know, who uses it? How does it fit into the rest of the world? That's actually quite hard to get from the code. You can, you can start scraping configuration files for user types, and you can start looking at integration points, but it's not going to give you a definitive answer. And then if you kind of step down through the levels, again, some of the architectural constructs and concepts get blurred and lost. So that's why you kind of need this additional layer of um, information, metadata, and documentation sitting on top of the code, essentially. So that's the way that the two can connect, right? Instead of being able to actually look at the, the yeah. code individually and say, oh, I can understand, I don't know, maybe what philosophy or what theory was being applied here. Right. The, okay. the, the other approach is to use um, something called an architecturally evident coding style. So basically, when you're, when you're writing your code uh, and, and you have an architecture in mind, you drop hints into your code base uh, so that your code reflects your architectural intent. Okay. It, it's a really simple thing to do, and there are lots of concrete things we can do as developers to do that. So naming conventions, packaging conventions, attributes, annotations. If you ask developers if they do it, that's <laughs> normally the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that? Just hard? It, it's not, it's not, not so much hard. It's just not a, a kind of mainstream concept that's caught on yet. But once you, once you kind of read all about this stuff, it makes perfect sense. And then you have to look at your code base and go, yeah, we should probably do this. What are the benefits of it? Is it something you can hand off easier, that kind of thing? The benefits are essentially you, you get a code base that reflects your architectural intent, so that diagram you have on the wall somewhere. Mm. Uh, and therefore, when you're explaining how the system works and how it hangs together, you can see those things in the code base. So if you look at a lot of the microservices styles of architectures, for example, uh, that's a way to produce architectures that are, have, uh, well, that they're made up of lots of separate things. Um, nice behavioral uh, boundaries and, and responsibility boundaries loosely coupled. If we apply that same design thinking to other types of systems um, through architecture of encoding styles, then you get a system that is actually easier to understand and easier to maintain and adapt as well. Now, you've been talking about this a little bit, so I may be working backwards here, but are, are there specific things that architects and developers can do to maintain a close connection between the architecture and the code beyond what we've, we've already been talking about? I guess the easiest way to do this is to, to move away from the situation where you have developers who write code and architects who don't. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of you know, getting architects on the team who can write code. Uh, so that's the easiest way to kind of bridge this gap. But coming at this from the other angle, it's, it's really about do all of your developers on the team understand what the big picture looks like and how to kind of step back and, and see the architecture. And that's something you can teach developers as well. So, you know, making developers more architecturally aware, essentially, is the other way to approach this. Uh, kind of related to that. So if a developer is, is looking to move into a software architecture role, uh, what types of mindsets should he or she try to adopt? It's really the, how, how do I step back and see the bigger picture? So when I've, when I've worked on teams, and, and I've, I, I, I did this myself during my early, early stages of my career, you kind of work on something in a silo and never kind of look outside that silo to see what the bigger system is. So, so really it's about how to step back to see the bigger picture. And in order to do that, you need to figure out how you think about and understand and describe systems. Uh, and again, that's, n that's not a skill I see many people um, teaching. It's not a skill I see many people practicing either. So that's why when you get these architecture diagrams, they're, they're, they're normally just a horrible mess. So it's really structure thinking. Uh, from a management standpoint, it is if you come from a development background, move into software architecture, is there an actual danger of getting lured back to the code? Can, can that be a problem? It can be a problem. 
I guess one of, one of the, the pieces of advice here is if you, if you are an architect, don't code all the time. Mm. Uh, and, and if you look at the people who make the best architects, they've normally come from a coding background, and that's you know what they love and enjoy. Right. So there, there is a very very slippery slope of you know I'm just going to start coding all the time, and then nobody's looking after the big picture. Sure, right, right. It actually is a job. The big picture is a job. It's yeah, not, well, it's, it's because you're not in the code. It's mean part it's of the role. So right. I, I like to think of architecture as a role. Okay. And whether that's one or many people on the team, but yeah, the, the, the big picture. You know, I wanted to ask you about that because I've read a post recently that was talking about it was advocating for. Um, software architecture is a skill yeah. as opposed to a particular position. What, what's your take on that? My take on that is very simply it depends on the team you have. So if you have a bunch of junior people, then I think it's better to have one dedicated person who's doing the architecture role. But if you have a team of really super smart people, then yeah, by all means share it out and make sure it's a, a collaborative responsibility. Okay. There's no single right answer. So last question for you. What people or projects are you following these days? What people and projects am I following? I'm definitely following the microservices movement. Uh, there's some really interesting stuff going on there. And I'm also following the kind of infrastructure as a service, platform as a service stuff. Uh, so things like Pivotal Web Services, um, Vagrant, Docker is, of course, the, the new hot thing as well. So I'm kind of keeping an eye on that stuff. It's not really my core area of uh, specialism and expertise. So that's, that's one of the other reasons. Great. Well, thank you for being with us. No problem. Thank you.